All right, so yesterday we started our first day of uh, writing some code. Uh, we did a little bit of basic freestyling with uh, the concepts of the code, and then uh, you want the book as soon as possible so that you can follow along. Um, if you have the book, you can take it out. Let's take a quick look what the first bits are about. Page six, for example, uh, tells you the structure of the book. It's going to cover HTML and CSS with practical examples. We're going to have some assignments that are based on the practical sections of the book, meaning that they, uh, they build up content and then they, uh, you have enough information to then create something interesting. It uh, talks about screen readers and web browsers you can read. Chapter 1 is very, very introductory. You can read that on your own. Uh, talks about how the web works, connecting to web servers, and then chapter one, the structure. So that's where we'll start. How pages use structure. HTML describes the structure of pages. So we kind of covered all of this stuff, but page 21 is a nice page that kind of explains the general concept that you have tags that are used to wrap around elements. HTML, Hypertext Markup Language. It marks this is a heading, this is a picture, this is a link. So you want to check out that on your own. And there's a really big example, page 23. It shows you that all HTML is basically in tags. A starting tag and an ending tag. And what was the big secret about the ending tag as opposed to the starting tag? Forward slash. Forward slash. So you start a tag, you end a tag, and in between is content, like a picture or text, but it has to have the forward slash or just slash, and it's first. People sometimes make the mistake to put the slash after the, the word of the tag. It's p tag slash p tag for paragraph, which we didn't look at yet. Uh, page 25, we'll start to look at this very quickly. Uh, we have these concepts known as attributes. So, attributes. I'm going to write notes also. Uh, you can write your own notes, or you can just uh, copy my notes when I finish them at the end of the day. But I want to make a note here of what they're mentioning of attributes. So, HTML tags have a pair. So we have a uh, paragraph tag, content, closing paragraph. And we have attributes. HTML tags may have attributes. Not all of them have an attribute. An attribute is something like this. The example listed in the book is that you have, like, you know your paragraph tags then you have an attribute inside of the tag inside of the angle brackets is where you add attributes extra features the example on page 25 says lang what do you think lang stands for language so we're saying here that uh, the language of this paragraph is in this language here what language do you think that is English US, English US version so you know, you can set it up like that. The language of this paragraph is English UK version. What about this? What do you think that language is? Spanish, Spain, Spain variation. So the attribute here of language, of lang, is saying the stuff inside of this P tag, inside of this paragraph, is in Spanish, Spain variation, which would be different than Spanish Mexico variation, MX. So attributes are things we're going to use a lot because there's the, there's the tag itself which has these built-in invisible attributes and then we have the ability to change or specify attributes. So attributes are used to refine or define or redefine a tag.
The book says it attributes provide additional info about the content of an element. And they are in a name and value pair. This will make more sense as we do it later, but there is a name of an attribute, lang, and its value in this case is es-mx. Name and value pair, attribute in a tag. <coughs> yes? Would font color also be an attribute? Yes, we have many attributes. One of them is that, the paragraph, its font, uh, style or font color or font size those would all be attributes yes so uh, name and value pairs are used that's the syntax we'll use that term a lot syntax syntax is basically how do you write it what's the correct way to write it so we talk about English syntax or Japanese syntax there's a way that you write English properly. There's a way that you write Japanese properly. You know, languages like English, you say, the cat is red. Or you say, you know, the, right, you say it in that order, the, the, the adjective before the noun, or whatever the rule is. And then in other languages like Spanish, you say, el gato rojo, you know, backwards, kind of. You say the, the object first, and then the, the adjective. So that's a syntax of a language. Uh, HTML and all of these programming languages have a syntax. The correct way to write the language. And we said previously that syntax errors are easier to figure out than the other kind of error. Syntax errors are, oops, I typed it wrong. I typed, uh, you know, on title I wrote, uh, I added an A instead of an I. I wrote title wrong, so it's a syntax error and I wrote it right. I started my p tag, but I never ended the p tag. I never did a slash p. That's a syntax error. I didn't write it right. That's one kind of error. What was the other kind of error I mentioned? Logic errors. So logic errors. Harder to figure out. It requires more debugging and figuring out your failure point. It's a little harder to, to give an example right away at this point in our um, knowledge about an example of a logic error, but we'll see it as we go later on where uh, I created a variable and I set the variable to the wrong number and therefore my loop didn't work. So I wrote all of the code properly to create a variable to create a loop, but I didn't start the loop properly, the right number. And that was a logic error, and that's harder to figure out. But we'll see we have various ways to debug our code. So one very common way to debug our code, common debug software or tool, your web browser. Every web browser has built in nowadays a way for you to debug your code. Uh, usually it's by pressing F12 on the keyboard when the browser loads up. We'll see that in just a moment. This is a way for help us to, to figure out our, our, our code, what's wrong with it. Every browser has it now. So page 27 mentions the tags that we've done before. Um, let's start to write some of that code. And then chapter 1 is done really fast. So. <clears throat> my process previously that I said is we should create a folder uh, with today's date and then put our files in that folder like the starting file and any pictures or other uh, items that are related so all of our content of a project is in a folder that's going to be our, pro our process and then we have the special considerations of file names and such so to remind ourselves to remind me, what's the software that we're using in this class to write our code? Notepad++. So go ahead and go to your Start menu, search Notepad++, and select Notepad++. Did anyone go home yesterday very excited and download the software and start to work? Okay, extra credit. Minus points for everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> you need to practice this. I don't work. Okay, very good. Ten points plus. So you need to practice this stuff because if, it, if you don't do it, you know, you use it or you lose it. 
uh, if you don't remember, okay, how do I add that tag? What does it mean? How do I write an attribute? You're going to forget how to do it when you need to do it. It happens all the time. It's happened to me. You know, when I'm really in the midst of doing projects where I do a lot of coding, it's in my mind all the time and I write it right. Then some weeks or months pass and I haven't touched it. I get back into it. I'm like, how does it go again? So I have to go look it up. I have to go back to my code from a few months ago, remind myself, and then do it again. So the more you do it, the more it sticks. I'm going to go ahead and open Notepad++. Did anyone uh, try the other uh, code editors that I recommended besides Notepad? Did anyone try Text Wrangler or Visual Code? They're all good. They all work well. But in this class, I'm recommending Notepad++. So the first thing we want to do here is we get an empty file. Let's go to File Menu, Save As. We'll often create a new file when we come in, or we might use an old file, and I'll tell you when is when. Yes? How do we turn on the, the feature where it automatically wants to fill in the uh, On Visual Code, I need to remember that. Uh, so uh, let me look it up in a moment. But you, in the meantime, you can go to do a search and, and look up how to turn off autocomplete on Visual Code. Let's do Save As. You should have a flash drive, hopefully. If you want to take the, ho the work home with you, as I said previously, these computers have deep freeze, so whatever you do on these computers will get erased if you don't take your work with you. If you email it to yourself, you can take it back with you that way, or you upload it to your Dropbox and such. For the moment, I'm going to save this to the desktop. So I'm going to go to the desktop, and then I'm going to create a new folder. Eventually, I won't walk you through these baby steps every time, you'll know to do it. But uh, go to the desktop, create a new folder with today's date, and in that folder we're going to save our file. So new folder, I'm going to call it with today's date, 2017-05, oops, 06, 06, aren't we? I'm thinking it's last month. Um, so. Uh, create that folder inside of the folder today's work June 6th remember what I said here uh, no capitals and spaces dot HTML I save as type set it to hypertext markup language Dot .html as well, 6.html. That's the file that you're saving in the folder of June 6th. This will be much more important as our semester goes on, because eventually we're going to incorporate images and other related files and all of those things should be should be placed together since we're starting with a brand new blank document we have to set up some of our basic content again uh, page 27 is basically telling you an example of a basic basic website so to remind ourselves, we're going to write tags. We're going to start with the angle brackets, less than, greater than, exclamation dot doc type. In a moment, I'll remind, I'll tell us how to turn off the autocomplete for Notepad. Autocomplete is very helpful later on when we want to write our code quickly, but as a beginner, we may want to ignore it. So I'll just press escape on the keyboard to ignore it, and I'll tell you how to turn it off in a moment. So our first um, line is telling us we've got an HTML5 compatible or compliant document. Enter, next line, we need the HTML tag, which has a pair. Remember, the doc type does not have a pair, but the HTML tag does have a pair. so. HTML slash HTML. Remember, I'm not going to say over and over less than, greater than, and all of that. I'm going to say the HTML tag, which is a short way to say you open the tag, you close the tag. Next, we need the 
head tag, and then the body tag. So we saw this last time. This is not new. And then the title tag. Just write something like that. Once we've got that, we want to save it and run it to so see the result. Remember our process, you save the file, then you go to the Run menu, and you select one of the web browsers. I'm going to go with Firefox because it's the first one, but we've got Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer. Just write that, nine lines of code. Technically, that's a complete website. Very, very basic. But go ahead and save it and then launch it from the Run menu in any of the web browsers you like. So page 27 explains the body tag is everything that's visible in the main part of the web browser. Head tag appears before the body, and this contains information about the page. You might call it meta information. Meta data is in the head tag, stuff that's not visible in the body, but it's part of the uh, document that defines aspects of the document, such as the title of the document. Specifically, then the title tag contents of the title element are either shown in the top of the browser above where you usually type the address or on the tab of the page if your browser uses tabs so once you check that in the browser you'll see that what's visible in the body is nothing but the name of the document the title is in the tab So we did that previously, that's nothing major. Did everyone get a result here? We haven't gotten to it in the book, but we did it last time. I want text to appear here. I want the name of this class. I want you to type the name of this class so that it appears here. But I want it to look big and bold and important looking. Remember how we did that last time? Try that right now. Make yourself a nice, big, bold heading in the body so that it's visible on screen. If you weren't here last time, we have a tag, heading 1, H1, CIS152, HTML, and CSS. True or false? I'm typing this wrong because the tags are on the same line. Why? Why is it not wrong? The web browser can interpret. What's that? As long as you have an opening tag and a closing tag. That's right. As long as we open and close or properly write the code, it should not care. The web browser will interpret the language, the code, properly. And the web browser does not care if it's on one line or multiple lines. Technically, all of these things could be on one line. I could write all of this on one line, line one, that goes on and on and on and on all the way over here. I could have written all of this on one line. The problem with that is that it's unreadable. I can't read it myself. I need to read and write my own code. But the browser doesn't care. So sometimes I might write my code, my tags, in multiple lines, and sometimes in the same line. doesn't matter. I personally like to write it in one line when it's one sentence, one simple word or sentence in between the tags. And I like to break it into multiple lines when there's lots of things in between, just so that I can quickly find the tags. So, so far my code looks like that, my result, my interpreted code. Now you may notice that I'm uh, zooming in and out of my code. I do that for the readability of the classroom. 
Uh, you can do this yourself also in two ways if you're interested. If you want to zoom in completely if, on Windows, if you want to zoom in any part on your screen, you know, I put my mouse over here and then I can zoom in. If you want to know how to do that, on your keyboard, you can hold the Windows key and press the plus key on the number pad and that'll zoom you in to any portion of your screen. Windows key minus will zoom you out. So sometimes if you need to zoom into a window, or let's say, you know, your parents are having trouble seeing it, so you can Windows plus. And you can see, can you see that now, Mom? In, uh, on the Mac, you have to hold, I think, Command, and then scroll up, but you have to activate it in your accessibility screen. So if you're interested in that, you can let me know. Uh, so I zoom in and out of the screen all the time so you can see my code. That zooms in anywhere on the screen. Another way is you can zoom in and out in Notepad so you can see the code a little better, like that. Notice how I'm, I'm zooming in on Notepad only so you can see the code. That one works by pressing Control on the keyboard and Plus on the number pad. Control Plus, Control Minus. So you've got a, a whole full screen zoom by pressing Windows, Key, and Zoom. And then you've got a Notepad zoom by pressing Control, holding Control, and pressing Plus. Zoom Tips. Windows Key, so Windows and plus full screen zoom now obviously then when I zoom in I have to reposition my my screen and we've got control and plus zoom in on notepad and a lot of other software works for that too control plus also works usually in your web browser if you want to zoom in in your web browser, I'm in Chrome or Firefox, and I want to zoom in to that web page, I can do Control Plus, and it zooms me in. Zoom in on Notepad or web browser. So sometimes, you know, you're working with your code here, and it's a little too small for our nice big monitors. Uh, you can do the zoom, which you can also find under in Notepad. View, menu, zoom, right here. Control, number pad, plus, control, number pad, minus. Restore default zoom. Control, number pad, slash. Takes you back to regular magnification. So that's also found in the view menu. There it is back to normal. Sometimes I'll zoom in here, sometimes I'll zoom in here. You want to get used to those shortcuts. If you noticed in the menu, it also gives me another shortcut, which might be even faster. Control, mouse wheel, scroll up. Control, mouse wheel, scroll down. My hand's already on the mouse, maybe, and my other hand's already on the keyboard, maybe. So if I hold Control and then on the mouse wheel, I can scroll up and scroll down. That might be even faster. those zooming tips, I think are going to be very useful for you to read your code uh, comfortably. Because once we start to write hundreds of lines of code, it can get pretty cumbersome or annoying um, seeing our code. Um, right now, the um, page 33 mentions uh, coding in a content management system. It talks about making websites in different software. Uh, for example, WordPress is another very popular way to make a website. There's also Dreamweaver, Joomla. There's lots of ways to make a website. We're making it in one of the most basic ways, in one of the most stripped down ways, because it's valuable, I think, to learn the hard way first. And then once we know that, we can then take advantage of shortcuts. So we're writing our code ourselves. Uh, very raw. Um, the autocomplete that is popping up may be an impediment at the moment. Uh, it may be giving you too much, too many hints. So I'm starting to type, you know, H3, and then it's, it, it feels maybe in the beginning I'm cheating. It's giving me too much info. 
if you want to turn off the autocomplete in Notepad, it's under Settings. We can go to Settings, we can go to Preferences. And then it is found under Auto Completion on the left. Enable Auto Completion on each input. It's on. Later on, once I get the experience and I just want to make a website quickly, I w maybe I want to leave it on. But right now, as a beginner, I would recommend, for the full learning experience, turn this off. So go to Settings, Preferences, Auto Completion, Category, Turn Off. I'm going to turn it off myself. Uh, every time you turn on these computers, remember, it forgets everything that you did, including these settings. So you'll have to turn them off again if you're interested in turning it off. So turn off, how to turn off autocomplete in Notepad. Settings, menu, preferences, autocomplete. Turn off, enable autocomplete. So I'll close that, and now when I start to type my tags, it will not pop up to help me. That's your choice if you'd like to change that. One more thing to make life easier for you in coding. We're seeing that Notepad automatically color codes our code. It's not that it's going to kind of color code it for errors exactly. It's just going to give you different colors for different things. Tags are blue, so that's telling me if I expected to type uh, my code uh, properly, it should be blue. If you look at it now, there's an error. It's not a tag. I misspelled head. I type heed instead of head. So that looks like a tag, but it's not a tag because it didn't recognize it. It's not blue. So that's the way that it's trying to tell me there's a mistake there. Later on, um, when we do attributes, you don't have to type this yet, but remember in the book we had lang equals English US. Later on when we do attributes, you, you don't have to type this yet, but attributes will be red. Red doesn't mean error, it just means it's an attribute. And then the, the name and the value. The value is purple, so the color coding is to tell you what do you have. This is a tag, this is an attribute, this is a, a, a name of an attribute, this is a value of an attribute. Later, we'll write CSS for styling. That'll be another color. Later, we'll write some JavaScript. That'll be another color. So the color coding in a, in a uh, code editor is there to help you read your code uh, uh, properly, efficiently, and help you figure out errors. We can configure this as well, because the default color coding is actually not that good. The default color coding is basically a white background with my text. But this is a white background that is blasting photons of light at you. As long as you are writing your code, you're looking at this big, bright screen for hours. And that's bad for your eyes. That's bad for your health, to be staring at a white screen that long. There's a better color scheme, which is often a darker color scheme, so that it's not so much bright light in your face. Let's check this out. Go to your settings. Go to Style Configurator. Style Configurator. I don't think Configurator is a real word, but we get the idea. Style Configurator. Select Theme. We've got the default. We have a bunch of other styles here. For example, Obsidian. When you select that, you get that color scheme, which is much better for your eyes. You don't have all that bright light shining in your face. You've got a darker background, easier on the eyes, you still have color coding, it's going to be different colors now. Instead of blues and purples and yellows and all that, it's different colors, but now it might be a little easier to read. 
We have Twilight, just a variation. The fonts are different. Zen Burn. Bespin, I like Bespin. I also like Blackboard. So we have all of these great ones to choose from. Monokai, Navajo. I think Navajo is one of the ones that's not that doesn't quite work because it's still a bright, it's still a bright color. So you have all of these different ones. Ruby blue is kind of nice too. So you can choose any one of these colors if you'd like. Um, they're a little easier on the eyes. I'm gonna keep the default one because it looks best on my projector. These dark ones are a little harder now for you to read. So I'm going to keep it on default, but I would recommend to switch to any of the other ones. But if you're going to be serious, if you're going to be a real coder, you've got to select Hello Kitty. <laughs> so I'm going to keep it on the default, and you can choose whichever you want. Save and close. And we'll get back to coding. So one final note here, pro tip. Pro dev tip. Change your theme to a dark theme, like Bespin, Blackboard, or what was that other one? Ruby something. Uh, to avoid eye fatigue. Because especially if you're in a dark environment like this and you have bright light shining in your face, that's basically a flashlight in your face, you're going to have eye fatigue uh, and then you're going to make mistakes and coding will be a little more difficult. And then chapter one ends pretty fast. Chapter two, we need to talk, start, start talking about text. We have tags that will mark up text. We've marked various aspects. We've marked various aspects of the document so far. And then we started with H1, page 43. HTML has six levels of headings, H1 through H2, uh, or through H6, that is. Browsers display the contents of the headings in a different way. Page 43 shows you that the different numbers, H1, H2, H3, give you different sizes but you don't simply want to use heading one, two, and three for their size. You want to use them for their meaning. For example, in my syllabus, I used headings there. Let me pull up the syllabus briefly. Uh, headings are used best when they're used to divide sections of your content, not simply for numerical order. You want to use headings to divide your content. So we'll see when this pops up. There we go. So we'll see. Even if I zoom out like this, you can't read that. But you can see that it's divided up in a nice way. There is something that stands out at the very top that defines the whole document. That's an H1, the whole document heading 1. Then there are sections. You can't read them, but you can see there's a section here, and a section here, and here. They're divided by space, sure, but then there's a heading for each of these as well that defines that element. That's a heading two. That's a heading two. Heading two, heading two, heading two. So it's not that this is heading one, heading two, heading three, four, five, six. It doesn't work that way. Heading one is what's the whole document about? Heading two is its own section. Heading two is its own section. Its own section. I don't think I have any heading threes in the document, but that would be a subsection of another section theory here, actually, uh, grading heading 2, heading 3. This breaks down the percentages of the grades. This tells you all of the assignments. So this is all one unit here. Heading 2, heading 3, because heading 3 is related to heading 2. That's when you would use the subsequent numbers. So for us, in our code, I want to write a second heading for today's date. After heading 1, H2. Oh. 
When I teach coding, I usually teach to get into the practice of writing the pairs of tags first before the content. You can easily forget the second pair, especially if you don't have autocomplete. So what I'm saying is, I know I'm going to write the date, but I'm going to start my tag and complete my tag and then add the content because I might start that and then go on, go on, and I forgot to close that H2 and everything's going to be messed up. So I recommend you open and close your pair of tags and then fill in the detail. Day 2. June 6th. 2017. So then I'm going to uh, I'm going to use a shorthand. I'm going to start to then say save it and run it. That's my shorthand to save your file, run it in the browser. So you type something, you save it, then you run it. You launch the browser. That's what I have so far. Heading one, nice and big and bold. Heading two, slightly bigger, slightly bolder, not as much. Heading three would be smaller and bold and all of that. But the meaning of those tags is that we, um, we're using them for emphasis and dividing up our content. Early on, people say, OK, it looks nice, but what if I want to change the font or the alignment or the size or the color? That's what CSS is about. We're going to see that about halfway through the book, our projects will look really boring because we're not going to really do any design until we get to CSS. CSS, that's what that's designed for, to set your colors, your alignment, your backgrounds, your images, and all of that stuff. So my answer to how do you make it bold or change its color and all of that, I'll say wait for page 400. <laughs> you know, we have to wait a little later. Um, that's enough for the moment there. Um, let me mention something that the book talks about later which is comments. I don't remember what page it's on, but I want to mention comments. You can write comments in your code. Remember when we saw the, the Firefox home page? We looked at its code. There was a drawing of a dragon in the code. That code was not valid code. It was, it was a comment. So we can write comments in our code for a couple of reasons. One is to make comments or notes for ourselves. You know, this means this, or make a note. Don't forget to do this. And another reason to write comments is to deactivate our code. So let's do this. After H2, we're going to write the comment tag. It's a weird one. Slash asterisk, which is shift 8, space asterisk slash. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. That's. JavaScript. I'm thinking of JavaScript. Sorry. Take that back. The HTML comment. Less than exclamation point dash dash. It turned green. And these turn green also in my case. You have a different color scheme. That's a comment. The ending tag space um, dash dash greater than. That's a comment. This is an HTML comment. It is ignored by the browser. If I were to save and run this, this sentence should not appear in the, in the body. Because this special tag, it has a pair, but its syntax is very different than every other tag. You have to write it like this, no spaces anywhere here. It's less than exclamation point dash dash. Space there, sure, and then stuff, and then space, and then dash dash, greater than no spaces there. That special syntax creates a comment. And the result is it does not appear on screen. Next line. 
comment again, but this time I'm going to break it up into multiple lines. This is a multi-line comment. Above was a single line comment. So what you can do is write your comment as one line, you just have to close its pair. Or you can write your comments in multiple lines. Comments are useful for writing yourself notes. You can write this if you want or not. Writing yourself notes or deactivating code. Deactivating code. As you're writing your code and you're and maybe you make mistakes or something and then there's an error and you're trying to figure out where's the mistake, one way to debug your code is to turn off some of your code so that it doesn't get in your way of figuring out what you need to fix. So a comment will deactivate a code. We saw that H1 made the text appear big and bold and all of that. You don't have to do this, but if I go back and wrap a comment around H1, this has become green by this color scheme, and now it's deactivated. So you saw a moment ago that H1 worked, and now if I run my code at this point, uh, H1 is ignored, is deactivated. Right there, it went away. It was there a moment ago. Now it's not. This is why I, I, I say definitely um, complete your tags, or else you get might into trouble. Like if I started to comment out my title over here for some reason, and I forgot to close it, suddenly everything in my document has been commented out, and everything in my document disappears. I'm like, what did I do wrong? Well, I forgot to comment, finish my comment. So always try to complete your tags before filling in the details. Question? That does matter also. You should put it in the order, in the logical order, meaning, you know, H1 is the most important thing on the page, heading 1. So it should be first. Heading 2 then is a sub element of heading 1, so it should become next. It should come next. Uh, you wouldn't want to put an H3 before an H2 because logically it just doesn't follow, like on my syllabus. Okay, that's a comment. We'll see it's very useful. There's another kind of comment. I wrote it. I wrote the other kind of comment. Ignore that until we get to CSS and JavaScript. But this is the, the way to comment your code. Next line. Page 44, we talk about paragraphs. Plain old paragraphs. So P tag. This one, I will break it into multiple lines because I'm going to write stuff in between. P for paragraph. Some of them are named, obviously, body, title. Some of them are short, H1, P for paragraph. This is going to be a paragraph. So uh, we're going to write a few things here. Uh, let's write during the summer semester at SWC, comma, enter. I'm enrolled in instructor Victor Campos's enter class of CIS 152. Save and run that. How many of you ever took a typing class in high school or college? Okay, good. That'll definitely help you when you're coding. If you didn't, we offer typing classes at Southwestern College. It's never too late to learn especially if you're going to do a lot of coding 
because that way you can quickly use your keyboard and type your code. Obviously, you can be just fine with the classic technique. They call it hunt and peck. Right? You have to hunt for your keyboard and you peck the key. That's perfectly fine, but once you know how to type, you'll be able to do it a little better, a little more efficiently. Not better, efficiently. Save it and run it. See any problem? I thought I pressed enter at the end of each of these lines. And why did it not happen here? Trick question, I haven't taught you that yet. Yes? You have to put in a line break. Exactly, okay. trick question, we haven't learned it yet. But you're, you're right. Um, HTML in the web browser uh, ignores when you press enter. It doesn't treat it as an actual enter. You have to put a tag, a line break tag, to break the line. So here, it, I thought I was writing three lines, but the browser said, nope, you wrote one line. So if we want to force a line break, we have the break tag on, uh, line, on page 48, which is basically at the end of the line, we're going to type BR. Now, the book is showing it slightly different. I'll address that in a moment. But that breaks the line. One line, break it here. Another line, break it here. It ends. I don't have to break it there because the paragraph ends. Use br tag to break a line. So comments, I would recommend make yourself notes. I'm not going to do it all the time, but I'm going to make notes once in a while here. If I introduce a tag that explains what it does, make yourself no notes and comments writing your code. It will be ignored by the browser if you typed it properly. It does increase the size of your document, but that's a good trade-off because you're writing yourself notes to help you understand your code. The, um, do you need to have a closing for the VR? No, this is one of the special cases. Page 44, 48 says, um, browsers will automatically show each new paragraph, but if you want to add a line break inside the middle of a paragraph, you can use the break tag, BR. This is one of the special cases. Use BR tag to break a line. Does not have a pair. There's a couple of tags out there that don't have a pair. This is one of them. Checking the browser. Now it broke it how I expected it. A sentence, a line break, a sentence, a line break. The book shows it in a slightly different way. It shows it like this. They're both right. This was the way for HTML, HTML4, <clears throat> and we're using HTML5. <clears throat> so they're both valid. This way is also valid if you're using like XML syntax, which is another kind of code. They're both right. Uh, you can go look up online which one is right. Uh, both of them will tell, both camps will tell you this way or the other way. They're both right. This is one of the things that people fight about, and they're both right. I use this one because it's less typing. <clears throat> it's two characters, yeah, a space and a slash. And if I know how to type, I can type that quick. But it's less typing, it's less effort, it's less <clears throat> possibility of making a mistake. So I would recommend whenever there's a way to do something that's a little simpler, do the simpler way. And technically, it's also less characters, two bytes less of data. And if I'm doing this 20 times in my document, those two bytes add up 2 times 20. It adds up to more data. It adds up to a slower site, a little bit at a time. Yeah, but if you've then got 10 pages on your site, 500 pages on your site, those little bytes add up. So it's completely super superfluous. You could do either way. I'm going to do the non-slash way. Yes? How many bytes is one, like one line? 
Well, one line depends on what's in the line. But basically, like empty. if the line is empty, yeah. that is one byte. That is one byte. Because there's a hidden character there that defines there is an empty line here. So even one empty character is a byte. That's why uh, you know, I put some things on a single line. Because I've saved myself a little bit of space sometimes. Uh, so if you want to get really, really detailed about it, that empty space right there is taking up a byte. So that is the break tag. Does not have a pair. Let's make another paragraph. Another paragraph. These do not have P1, P2, P3. They're simply a new paragraph. We're going to learn all about HTML, CSS, and even some JavaScript. We will not learn about we will not learn about e equals MC squared or H two O. Now, the point of this is that on page forty five and forty six we have a couple of other tags that will help us set up our structure. Our structure, that's what our HTML is doing at the moment. We're creating paragraphs and headings. We're breaking the lines. Part of structure is also, is also this. I want to make some of these things bold, some of these things italics, some of these things superscript, and some of these things subscript. So, we have the way to to make elements bold listed on page 45 but I want you to make a note to ignore page 45 page 45 tells you the old ways to set something bold and italics so how to bold or italicize italicize ignore Page, page 45 in the book. Use page 51. So I'm not even going to mention that page. I'm going to go straight to 51. I'm jumping back and forth a little bit. P page 51 is the modern recommended way to make things bold or italics. To make something bold, we use the strong tag. We're going to make this text strong, which means bold. And then italicize. We're going to emphasize something. So it'll be italicized. We have strong, and we have emphasis. I want to make the words HTML and CSS bold, and the word JavaScript italicized. So I'm going to wrap the strong tag around HTML. Strong. This is the modern way to bold something. The reason it's not called bold is because people access websites in more than one way now. In a visual way, sure, but also in an audio way. If I have visual impairment, if I have a visual impairment, my computer, I might have it set up that it reads to me. So um, 
the computer is going to read a website to me. Strong is the modern way to then mark, uh, mark it as bold because it'll be bold for visual people and for audio people it'll be louder. That's how you specify boldness via audio. So strong is bold for visual users and louder for audio users. Bold is only bold. I then add strong tag as well to CSS. And notice I'm adding the strong before the comma. I could add strong, I could wrap strong around the comma as well. I'll show you the difference now, but I would recommend to not include the comma, and I'll show you why in a moment. But I've got strong around the word, and here I've got strong around the word and the comma. Run it. Launch your browser. And then now HTML is strong, it's bold. CSS is bold. On my projector, it's not so obvious, but also the comma is bold. Let me zoom in. The comma is also bold. That's not uh, on a technical level, I guess, wrong. It's more in a it's more wrong in a style way. If you take an English class and your sees and your teacher sees that that comma is also bold, they're going to shake their head because you don't want to bold punctuation. Punctuation shouldn't be bold in proper grammar. It's so subtle, and 99% of people will say, "Who cares?" But English teachers will care, and I care too. So I would not bold your punctuation. I would not italicize your punctuation, like an exclamation point or a period. There's no need to bold or italicize it. You don't do that. You do that for words. So that's what it looks like. That's the comma is also bold. You can strong the comma as well. 99% of people won't care. But those that will care will be shaking their heads. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so I'll leave it like that for for the shame of it. But uh, next, uh, JavaScript. I've got an exclamation point there. I'm not going to italicize the exclamation point. Italicize happens via emphasis. They thought emphasis was a, was a little hard to spell, so it's simply M. The M element indicates emphasis that subtly changes the meaning of a sentence. By default, browsers will show the contents of M in italic. By default. Again, other instances. I have to have the 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 tech the, the document read to me. Let's say I, I am uh, completely blind. Well I still want to visit websites. I have a special computer that reads the screen to me. This exists. And so when it reads it and it comes to emphasis it'll emphasize those words in a different way for me to understand audio wise that it's it's got italicized or some other emphasis I will not include the exclamation point because again you don't add styling to those symbols going back to 100 percent zoom I um, you should see that the you should see that the uh, word JavaScript is italicized. It's got emphasis. MC squared H2O. When you see that equation, the famous Einstein equation, MC squared equals MC squared, isn't the 2 a little bit high up here? Mm -hmm. yes. That's a superscript. We have a tag that will let us structure that. And the H2O, when you see H2O, don't we see the 2 a little bit lower? That's subscript. We can do that as well. These things that we're doing here are not really design, uh, design code. That's CSS. This is still structure code. We're structuring our document, not really designing it. Page 46. Superscript to make your text higher up. So uh, go back to your MC squared and add soup, add sup, superscript, obviously only to the two. That's what I want to raise up. And then subscript, 
sub sub tag to the 2 of h2o. invention 1989 that changed the world marking a document to set it up like this the HT part which is links we haven't talked about that yet but even that was a big revolution linking documents in the document or to other documents someone had to invent it at some point we have cars now but that took years to invent we have airplanes but that took years to invent we have websites that are so part of our lives but it took time to invent it someone that put these ideas together and now they're part of our lives. Running that gives you that. The code is interpreted, processed by the browser, shows the result. I've been running it in Firefox. I'm going to run it in Chrome as a comparison. You can use any browser you like, but I'm usually using Firefox just because it's faster to get to in the menu. And if I compare it with Chrome, it's slightly different. There it is side by side. The amount of space between some elements might vary a little bit. Notice how this dash here in Firefox is slightly different than this dash. Colon, and then the periods H2O. H2O, so there's slight differences in every browser, slight amount of spaces, because every browser thinks their way is the best way, even though there's a default standard, every browser is a little bit different, a little bit of an interpretation. Yes? Is H always closed by default? Which one? H, like H1, H2, H3. Yes. Uh, by default, it's going to be big and bold to stand out. And later with CSS, we can take away the bold, we can change the color, the font, the size, everything. But by default, it's going to be bold. So the browsers show things in a slightly different way that we have to deal with later. You know, there's a little bit of different space right here. It's like about two fingers of space here and over here. It looks like a little bit more, two and one quarter fingers. So that's just something we have to deal with. Um, even though websites have been around 28 years, every browser still kind of does it their own slightly different ways. Because, uh, you know, standards are great, but everyone can make a standard. Yes? Is browser like a compiler? Yes. Uh, you can think about it that way, but in a technical sense, we wouldn't say it that way. But yeah, basically, it's more of a renderer. And there's slight differences about what all of that means. But in short, yeah, the browser is the compiler for our code. Technically, the browser is the interpreter for our code. All right, so page 47 mentions that white space, empty spaces, are ignored by the web browser unless we force them. So if, for example, if I put a bunch of space right here, you don't have to do this, but if I put a bunch of space, it's clear that there's a lot of space here. And then when I interpret it or render it, it goes away. So white space is ignored. We have a code to force empty spaces, but the default is that the browser will ignore it. Just something to be aware of, because just like pressing Enter did not automatically create a new line, we had to use a tag. Um, when the browser comes across two or more spaces next to each other, it only displays one space. So whites, this is known as white space collapsing. You will often see a web page author take advantage of white space collapsing to indent their code in order to make it easier to follow. Later on, when we get into CSS and JavaScript, you, we will see that our code, it's often nicer to indent it or tab it so it all lines up nicely and is more readable. That'll make more sense later. So we're talking about 
this class H1, day two. Let's say we're going to create a brand new section in our document. That means more, uh, more headings. Uh, heading one so far right now defines the whole document of this section. I want a new section. So we'll add uh, an empty space. Uh, I'm on line 26. Your, lines, your line numbers may not line up. That's fine as long as you know where you're at. Here I am before the end of my body, after my last paragraph. Uh, I'm going to add another tag here, HR, <coughs> HR tag. And I'm going to add a comment here. Comments can be on their own line or on another line, but the comment needs to be complete, of course. I'm giving myself a note here of what that, com of what that tag does. HR creates a horizontal rule. A line. no pair. Again, the book on page 48 will tell you that one variation for writing that is like that, space slash. I'm going to save two bytes. Next line, h1. I'm kind of changing my topic here a little bit. So the HR, I'm using it as a visual representation to create a line, a very simple line. Later on, I can style the line, its color, its drop shadow, its width, and all of that. But I created a line. The book says this is also known as an empty element. There are a few elements or tags that do not have any words between them or content in an opening and closing tag. They are known as empty elements and are written differently. Empty element usually has one tag. Before the closing angle bracket, there is, there is an empty, uh, there will often be a space and a forward slash. Some web page authors miss this out, but it is a good habit to get into. So, um, Let's say I'm making a new section on a blog. In this section of the site will be articles. So just type a little something like that, run it. You should see the HR tag. Creates a horizontal ruler, a division that can be styled later by a CSS. Then we've got a whole new section. It's got its own heading, heading one. The blog follows here. Uh, subheading to further explain the section one particular item, which is a cookie recipe. These are all numbered one, two, and three, because logically they, they need to be. Uh, let's see, I've got another element. Paragraph here I'll say uh, to be filled in, because I want another H3. What's another kind of cookie recipe? 
oatmeal. Oatmeal raisin res cookie recipe. Got a new section with its own heading and its own subheading. Then you've got these elements, which I started to define as H3 and H3. These are sub elements of a larger element. Articles um, on cookies. I would fill in the details about that recipe. Checking the result. Looks like that. So this is about uh, structure. Looking back on it, I'm going to make a little change. This is a blog for articles. Articles here are recipes. I'm going to go back to H2 and say cool recipes for you. Because what I've written here are all recipes. So this chunk of information here is recipes, heading two. Maybe I want to write now articles about technology. So new line. H2, cool technology links for you. Heading 3, one link. Heading 3, another link. This is just to reiterate the concept of headings. Uh, another heading 2, cool tech links for you. Another H3. practice with headings conceptually. It's very important to understand early on. Uh, we use basically the right tag for the right task. We don't just use an H3 because it's a certain size and color. We use it because it has a meaning. Um, we may use an H1 more than once the right way because it's for a section of content. the right tag for the right task. Now in this case, in this example, what I've written here, this is starting to get into that point about slightly getting a little difficult to read. I would like to tab some of these things. Look at this very cool tip right here. I want to tab I want to tab these elements here. A, these H3s and paragraphs are sub elements of this. I want to tab all of these. A trick is you don't have to go to each line and press tab. You can select all of it, even half selected like this, and press tab once, and they will all tab in. So I've got them selected not very well. I press tab, they all tab over. So this is completely optional, but now it's more readable. I'm seeing I've got a section here with its sub elements. Same thing here. I want to tab all of these guys. I'm not going to waste my time by going to the beginning of each of these lines and pressing tab and pressing tab and pressing tab. I'm going to select them all and even like halfway selected. Look at this, I'm going to select the last character and the first character of those lines and that's enough of a selection that then if I press tab, all of them tab over. Visually, I like that a lot better. Code-wise, the browser doesn't care. Remember, white space collapsing. The browser is going to interpret that normally, but visually for me or the other people on my team that is coding this project, 
it's a lot easier to read. I would recommend as soon as possible also get used to using the keyboard as much as possible instead of the mouse. You know, if you move your mouse over to click right here, and you move your mouse over to click over here, okay, that works. But get used to using the arrow keys on your keyboard. Maybe I'll maybe I'll do an activity where I first force all of you to turn your mouse upside down for the whole day because we can manage to use only the keyboard. For example, here, I want to move to the right spot. So I'm using the arrow keys left and right, up and down on my keyboard. Um, obviously, I can do it with the mouse. But I'm about to click that spot. Whoops, I clicked above it. And I clicked in the right spot. That was a waste of time. Yeah, half of a half of a second. But you keep adding up those little mistakes, and they add up to wasted time. Keyboard is accurate. Up is one line up. Down is one line down, left and right. You can go exactly where you need to go. But I need to go all the way to the end of the line. Am I going to press right lots? If only there was a way to jump to the end of the line. There is. On the keyboard, there's a button that says End. If you never knew what that did, the End key on your keyboard jumps you to the end of the line. If only there was a, a way to go back to the home, to the beginning of the line. There is. There's a key that says Home jumps you back to the beginning of the line. So I hope you get practice using those keys, arrow keys, home and end. Oh look, there's a page up and a page down key. There's these keys that were built in here that existed before the mouse that programmers used for decades before the invention of the mouse to move around on their code. So when you're writing real code, I recommend get used to these arrow keys. And there's some other cool advanced things, like if you hold down control arrow key, it jumps you one word at a time. You don't have to press left and right 50 times. You press control, I'm holding control, and you press to the right and it jumps you one word at a time. Get used to that. Control up and down moves the, moves the screen up and down one line. I'll remind you about that. Yeah. I'll remind you about that. and. Uh, I would practice it using your arrow keys to navigate throughout your code. So how does your document look? It should look something like this. One section, divider, another section with content. Any questions so far? Go to your web browser, see the result of your project in the web browser, and press F12 on your keyboard. It's on the top number rows, F12. Depending on your web browser, you may get a screen or a panel that appears below or the right. It doesn't matter where it appears. So when you press F12, you get some sort of panel. Uh, depending on your web browser, <clears throat> you will also see tabs. Inspector, console, debugger, style editor, etc. It looks like that in Firefox, in Chrome. It looks like this on the right side. Here I get elements, console, sources, etc. If you're in Firefox, you can change where this appears right here. There's a there's an icon here to show you where you want to dock your panel. Right now in Firefox for me it's at the bottom. I can click here or here actually sorry. Um, dock to the side of the browser window. So if I want to put it on the side, I can put it on the side. In Chrome I have that also. It's uh, hidden in the little dots right here. Show it on the right side, on the bottom, on the, on the left. Pop it out to its own window. Whatever you want to use. We'll use this panel more later. But this is your developer's panel. This is the developer's panel that lets us debug our work. And if it's uh, on the bottom or the right, doesn't matter. But here, this is where error messages will pop up. And actually, there's been an error in our code that has existed that I haven't talked about yet. That's okay. 
In my case, Firefox is saying the character encoding of the HTML document was not declared. The document will render with garbled text in some browser configurations if the document contains characters from outside the US ASCII range. Blah, blah, blah. It's saying there's a little bit something missing in our code, which we haven't learned yet, so it's OK. But technically, the browser, Firefox, is being very strict. If you look at it in Chrome and you look at it in your console view, no error. Chrome is like, yeah, everything's good. But Firefox it says there's a little slightly wrong thing that we have. We don't have the character encoding. We get to it a little bit later in the book. I'll mention it now. Basically, Firefox is being very strict, and it says you're missing something in your code. And often it'll tell you on what document and what line. This one is not telling me what line number. But if, it, if it's a specific line of code that is wrong, the browser should tell you your document and then a line number. Um, to fix this, message that Firefox is giving us. Let's go back to our code. Back to the very top. We have our document type declaration. We have HTML. We have head. We have title. Before title, line 4, we're going to add a tag. The book doesn't get to it for a few more pages. But this is a tag that further defines what kind of document we have. Firefox is saying, technically, we don't know what character encoding we're using. Is this in English? Is this in Spanish? Is this in Japanese? We haven't quite said that determination. So Chrome is like, who cares? But Firefox is saying, we, you haven't defined it. It is better practice to do what we're about to do so that the browsers fully understand what your document is. So one more line here. This is, a, this is another tag, of course, but this one's special. Meta tag, it does not have a pair. But it has an attribute. We'll talk about attributes in more detail later, but an attribute then is something that you add to a tag inside of the angle brackets. Be very careful. Beginners often add this afterward, and it'll be wrong. You have to add attributes inside of a tag. The attribute, C-H-A-R-S-E-T, car set, or char set, however you want to say it, character set. What are the set of characters? What's the alphabet we can use, the characters? This is the name of this attribute, car set, equals a quote symbol, which is right next to your enter. I open the quote. Things change color. I need to close the quote. Because as I say, I like to open and close pairs of tags so that I don't make a mistake. And in the quotes, we'll type UTF-8. Yes? Is that kind of like uh, doing like hash, hashtag include IO stream like in C++ or something? Like where you're kind of well, include IO stream would be more of including a library of possible commands and such. Kind of. Right. Kind of, yeah. Here is definitely setting much more about the character set that we can use. But you can think about it that way as in including meta information, yeah. So here I'm saying, basically, I'm defining the set of characters, of languages, of, of symbols that I can use. And here we're using a very universal one, UTF-8. This includes like 50,000 characters or more. Not just letters in, in English, and, uh, in, in English, but also letters in Spanish, like you know, letters with the accent marks. We're including letters like, uh, like Swedish and such, with a little O with a little cross out. We're including letters, Hebrew letters, Arabic letters, Japanese letters. We're including basically all the letters of basically every language, every major language. We're saying we're, we're allowing ourselves or we're activating the usage of every language, basically. Because this could be set like, you know, what did it say over here? 
us-ascii. If we had set it to us-ascii, as Firefox is saying, this would only say we're only going to use letters that are in the US language, English, with the US variation. Well, we don't want to be limited. Maybe we're making languages that are, maybe we're making websites that are international, and we want to use all of these different characters. I want to use, you know, Spanish letters and Japanese letters. So this is a better character set. I'm going to make a note here. Meta tag does not need a pair. No pair. To define our character set. I'm going to break this into its into another line which is valid maybe tab it if you want just make sure you, when you press enter that you also bring the ending tag don't press enter at the end of the ending tag and write your comment because then you don't have a comment opening and closing comment uh, to def to defy to define our character set We chose UTF-8 all the characters. So I press tab and then a space just so that it lines up. Superfluous, but to me I like that because it looks nice. You know, that's off by one character and it's going to bug me personally. So I space it over and nice and lined up. Completely superfluous. But if you want to do that for your own coding, that's fine. Because I believe, and many others believe, uh, beautiful code is good code. So if your alignments are nice, tabs and spaces looks nice, nice code. Yes? So this would allow um, like somebody in China to read the website in Chinese characters, like it'll can allow their browser to convert what we've written in English into their language characters. Is that short answer? Yes, okay. it would let them uh, properly convert it because then we've defined what languages we have. Yes, the full conversion happens in different ways, but yeah, basically so that the language is, is parsable. Yes. Can you, do you have multiple character sets? No, you should have one character set. That's why it's best practice to use this universal one, which is like all the languages, basically. Because if we set it only to, you know, uh, Greek, we can't then further say, okay, I also want to choose Dutch. We can only have one at a time. There's another one, actually, UTF-16 which has even more characters, even for languages that don't really even exist. Uh, well, not exist, but that they've become extinct. Like, uh, you know, the Maya language, the Olmec language, you know, these languages that just don't exist anymore. UTF-16 includes them. But it's common to use UTF-8 for all common, modern languages and alphabets. Let's um, create a new section. So we'll do the same thing. You try this first. Make a horizontal rule, make a new heading, and <clears throat> the new heading will be called quotations. And then I'll show you some new tags here, starting on page 52. So divide up, divide up the document
will um, we'll see this new tag here block quote this is one of the longest tags block quote it's a big old word usually they're pretty short so the point of this is to have a quotation we are going to write a quotation Uh, but we still also use the P tag. Off the top of my head, we can do this quote here. quote HTML has <clears throat> the right tag for the right task my task is I would like to write a quote here this is a few sentences long I didn't put the breaks there but you get the idea this is a longer quote so I have a tag for that block quote the book mentions on page 50 that some tags there there are some tags that are not intended to affect the structure of your page but they do add extra information to the pages this is known as semantic markup semantic when you hear the word it's semantics you're talking about the meaning of things the meaning of block quote the block quote it has a special purpose to have a a quotation, a, a block of quotation, a couple of sentences of, of a quotation. The block quote element, page 52, is used for longer quotes that take up an entire paragraph or more. We still use a P tag inside of it. Browsers tend to indent the contents of block quote. However, you should not use the element just to indent a piece of text. Rather, you, you should achieve this effect with CSS. So the point of that tag is that I've got a, uh, a quotation, and it indented it. But the way people use it wrong is to add block quote when they want to indent things. That's not the point of block quote. The point of it is to show a quotation from a book or whatever. To style it, to change the alignment and indenting and all of that, once again, that's CSS. You know, we'll get to it in about 150 pages. Our documents, again, will look very boring for a little while. Let's say then, OK, we want to <coughs> attribute, um, we want to attribute who or where did that come from? Um, Uh, I'm taking that quote from somewhere. I wonder where. I wonder where. So we're going to then mark where did that quote come from. This is the this is that block quote. Where does it come from? Well, on the next line, after block quote paragraph. Site. The citation um, for this quote is right here. The default 
is that it italicizes it. Visually, it doesn't look like it's connected. However, we can fix that. But conceptually, we have a block quote, we have a quotation, we have this paragraph. There's a paragraph here that does cite. Now, you might ask, well, why is the paragraph inside of the block quote, but this time the cite is inside of the paragraph? It's a little hard to explain for the moment because we'll talk about block level elements and inline level elements later. But just to kind of keep it together as one unit, I'm going to move this citation back into the block quote. Either way would work fine, but for visually to keep that together, I'm going to move it. This will give you the example that we can actually move code. We have cut and paste, sure, but we can move our code too. So watch this. I want to make a new line below that paragraph, and then I'll select this code and just drag it up here. You can cop, you can select and drag code. Cut and paste works, but drag and drop also works. So first make yourself a new line before the end of the block quote and then select. In this case, you do have to select everything. Don't forget that piece. Right here, I, oops, I'm about to forget to copy, to move also that angle bracket that's going to break my code. Make sure you've selected the whole thing and just select it and drag it to where it should be. The point of that is to show you, you can move your code. <clears throat> just like you can move icons and such, you can move your code and that's very valuable. Sometimes though the alignment is a little odd, which you'll have to fix here. But I moved it over here. That citation, where did it come from now, is part of this block quote. It's all a unit together. I have to fix these tabs here. Can you get rid of those two on line 48 and 49? those two paragraphs? I could, but the reason I'm still using two different paragraphs is because this is a unit of content, so it's divided into its own paragraph. This is another unit of content. If I got rid of these, all of this would be one unit, this paragraph and this citation. And then the problem is, this citation will now appear right here because I never broke the line. So part of the reason I'm keeping the paragraphs is this is one unit, break, this is another unit, break. Could you also do it with break? You could, yeah. Okay. Here's the result now. There, it's indented to show that this is a unit together visually, code-wise and semantic-wise. The meaning, it's all together. It's all part of a quote. The citation is there. One paragraph, another paragraph. It's very common and perfectly fine to use paragraphs even for one sentence, even for one word, if you're using it the right way. Breaking this and breaking that, different paragraphs. We'll do one more thing here. You often see a little dash in front of a word, right? So we have, we have the dash, which is just, you know, dash, like that. But technically, that dash is, is a simple kind of dash. There's another kind of dash uh, that is more for this purpose. So we'll have a, a lesson on it later. Um, let's write this uh, right before the, the word Star Wars. Ampersand, which is your shift 7, the letter M. D A S H semicolon. We can write some letters simply by writing it on the keyboard. Some symbols you have to write the special code. For example, I want to write the letter E with the accent mark. I don't have that on my keyboard, but if I know the right code, I can write the letter E with the accent mark. This one, M dash creates a long dash. Look at that. There's the regular dash, there's a middle dash, there's a long dash, M dash. Creates that. Now that looks like the dash from a quotation. And in the way that I wrote it here, ampersand, the special code, semicolon. That's the right syntax. It shows up there. 
I did not put a space in between, but I could, and it'll write the space in between. Question? Is that CSS? No, this is still HTML. So we'll make a note here, and then we'll wrap up for the day. We're going to say block quote. Use block quote for uh, longer quotes than cite them. M dash special character. I think there's a class waiting for us, so we'll wrap it up very soon. Got writing the right tag for the right task. This code um, that I've written here, usually at the end of the day, I put a copy of my code into the network folder in case you want a copy of it to check your work. I will also put a copy on Blackboard so you can check it there. Remember, I've recorded this lecture. I'm going to upload it somewhere. You need to request the link. Send me an email requesting the link if you want to replay the video. Tomorrow is a lab day, so you can come in if you'd like to practice your code. But the next main lecture of the next topic is next Monday. So I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>